Dow Transports. Investors also focusing on President Trump's repeated acts or tax on the Federal Reserve. We've got Joel Griffith, who's the Heritage Research Fellow, and Ian King from Bayan Hill. He's a senior research analyst. Thank you both for joining us this morning. I'd like to just jump right into it, Joel, starting with you. So what do you make of the president as well as investors emphasizing these Fed hikes? Do you feel like it's possibly misplaced? Um, I think some of the emphasis on the, on the rate hikes is misplaced. The fact of the matter is, going back 10 years, the Federal Reserve intentionally reinflated two asset bubbles, the housing bubble and the stock bubble. And they did this um, intentionally, and they succeeded in that. Uh, so this, uh, President Trump did not create this bubble. Uh, this was created before his presidency and continued throughout. And now we're going to deal with some of that. But I think we look at, need to look at fundamentally, the economy does appear uh, to remain strong. And it's certainly growing at a more robust rate now than it was in the final year of President Obama's last term. Oh, I'm actually going to stick with that theme since you brought up bubbles. Ian, the economy is growing, which was just mentioned, but mm -hmm. what about debt? Do you think that the debt market is something that we really need to be concerned about? Sure. I agree with Joel in the sense that the Fed has reinflated multiple asset bubbles. This is what the Fed does. Monetary policy is a blunt instrument. It's not very surgical. And insofar as we might have exacerbated the virtuous cycle of the economy with the tax cuts of 2017, 2018, I think now we're starting to see the other half of that cycle. As the pendulum has swung to optimism so high in 2018, I think from an economic standpoint, we're going to swing back the other way. The market's already dropped. We're in a bear market. We've been in a bear market since October. The heuristic of 20 percent qualifies as a bear market, but I think we've already entered a bear market, and I think it's going to stay this way for the foreseeable future. So, Ian, you just actually mentioned the negative externalities of these tax cuts. But, Joel, I was reading your note uh, prior to just today's show, and you were talking about possibly suggesting more tax cuts going into 2019. But I'm, I'm a little bit confused about that, given the lack of investment that we saw from companies this year. Um, yes, I, I, you're absolutely correct. We need to focus on what actually produces long-term growth. Consumer spending is part of it, and we've seen that over the past year increase. What we need, though, is going to stoke long-term business investment. These tax cuts were definitely a positive. Longer term, you can expect these tax cuts to add about 0.3% to the annual GDP growth rate, and that's wonderful. But to actually produce more growth, we need to focus on uh, continuing to flatten uh, those tax rates and to actually stoke capital investments. And that did actually slow last quarter. We need to ensure that we increase that for the long term. I want to get to Bitcoin because we've been talking about it. We promised our viewers we would mention this massive drop over the past year. But last week there was a boost in value. Ian, do you think that maybe the tide has turned and things are going to be, you know, green for Bitcoin going into 2019? Well, you know, big drops in Bitcoin is just par for the course. We've seen four 70 percent drops in the past decade of Bitcoin's existence. But I think the bigger picture here is we've created something that's a bearer instrument, something of digital value that you can hold that can't be replicated. And I think this has bigger implications for such things as digital gaming or digital privacy online. So I don't I think it's a bigger story than just Bitcoin. Sure, we're going through a negative price cycle. We had the big optimism in the big price cycle early in 2018. We've seen the exact opposite of it in the last couple of months. But I think the biggest thing with this technology is you can now have a bearer instrument that's like gold, that's like money, but the market cap is 1% of gold. So millennials who are entering the workforce and they want to buy something that's not fiat currency, they don't want to buy stocks, they can buy Bitcoin. The market cap is still only 1% of the total market cap of gold. You just said that millennials can buy Bitcoin, but why has there been, and this is for you, Ian, why has there been no major adoption from stores and restaurants in terms of using the Bitcoin as opposed to just mm -hmm. trading it? Well, no one wants to use a speculative instrument that's so volatile as a monetary uh, unit. And I think one of the other issues is the network is very slow. So if you are going to buy coffee at Starbucks or Bitcoin, you have to wait for six confirmations, which can take up to an hour. There are solutions in place right now, such as the Lightning Network, such as these side chains, that are allowing for these transactions to happen instantaneous, just as fast as credit cards. And I'm looking for those to be kind of rolled out in 2019 
uh, with the backed exchange, which has one solution, and also with these other side chains. Joel, just on the same topic, you have a bevy of companies like JP Morgan, Citi, Goldman Sachs that were actually delayed their launch of Bitcoin. What do you make of that in terms of confidence going into uh, the next year? Well, there's no doubt that there's a demand for the cryptocurrency blockchain technology. There's a demand for privacy. And of course, there is a fear longer term that our currency can be devalued at will by the Federal Reserve. However, these particular instruments such as Bitcoin, they're unproven uh, as far as retaining their value. If you look at over the past year, the, the, the value has gone down in excess of 90%. That's not exactly instilling consumer confidence. Uh, so it's something to be explored. There's certainly concerns. And I'd say we can focus on lowering transaction costs. Uh, there are private enterprises that are working on technology that will reduce the costs involved with actually transferring fiat currency. We need the government to give private enterprise that space. And if we go ahead and actually retrain uh, fiscal, uh, the Fed's fiscal policies to actually ensure that we have, uh, that, we discon that we stop de devaluing the currency every year,